Okay. Now, uh, we will also be sharing the lecture uh, part of uh, the lecture part of this um, on Facebook, but we will cut off the feed before our discussion. So please feel free to ask your questions because that will not be part of Facebook. So, I have a lot of questions for you. I have a lot of questions for you. I have a lot of questions for you. I have a lot of and it is a pleasure having you all with us this evening, and we look forward to seeing you all every Tuesday until December 14th at 7 p.m. So my name is Alpina Kashian, and I'm a ministry staff member of the Eastern Diocese of the Armenian Church of America, and I oversee and manage all VEMCAR initiatives. And be before we go any further, I'd like to invite our primate, his grace Bishop Daniel Findikian, to start us with a prayer. Sir Pazan Haish. Thank you. Hanun Hor, Ye Vortvo, Ye Vokwin Serpo, Amen. Jesus, wisdom of the Father, give me wisdom to think, to speak, and to do good in your sight at all times. Deliver us all from evil thoughts, words, and deeds. Imastutun Hor Jesus. During the mastutun, as Paris Horel, Yev Hosel, Yev Korzel Arachiko Hamenainjan, Ichar Horutot, Sipanitsevi Korzot, Pergazis, Yev Ormiako Aradzot, Yev Ins Pasmameris. Amen. 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 Today is truly a significant day for at least, at least two reasons. It's the first day we're starting our adult Christian education sessions. Uh, and it is the Independence Day of Armenia. Among the great statements made in our anthem, I'd like to highlight the last one. But blessed is the one that is martyred for the freedom of his nation. As we strive to hold on tight to our freedom, Let's remember and pray for all of our soldiers who continue to pr protect our country, Armenia, and our people, as well as those who were martyred. Let's continue helping and praying for the families who lost their loved ones. So we would like to pause for a moment of silent prayer for all those who have lost their lives for Armenia and our faith. Armenia is 30 years old today. Tarerenk Abrel Paitsmanatselenk Badani. We have lived for centuries, but we are still young. Therefore, I'd like to note that Christ started his ministry at the age of 30. So today, we remind ourselves of our centuries old responsibility of building up the body of Christ. By now, Many of us already know that Vemkar is the digital ministry of our diocese. It is the online interface of the diocese's vision, building up the body of Christ. And one of the many things that Vemkar focuses on is providing opportunities for all to take part in building up the body of Christ. As the core Vemkar team, we also include, uh, which also includes my fellow colleagues, Deacon Eric Vazi and Vartan Sarkisian, we closely work with clergy and faithful from across our diocese to enhance our knowledge of the Son of God, minister to one another, and pray together. We have established various VEMCAR teams by working with talented individuals as we undertake various online and in-person ministries, 
A few examples are our VEMCAR virtual pilgrimage team, catechetical program team, Armenian language team, our mental health team. Among those, we have, of course, our VEMCAR adult Christian education team. It's an eight member team, Father Stepanos Dudukjan, Father Samuel Rith Najarian, Deacon Yerfant Kuchukian, Deacon Armen Terjimanian, Nancy Basmajian, Vartan Sarkisian, Rhonda Boyajian, the coordinator, and myself. So the root of the Vemkar Adult Christian Education is the adult Christian education program of one of our diocesan parishes, St. Peter Armenian Church of Waterville. And Father Stepanos will talk more about this in a few minutes. For now, I'd like to turn the screen over to Rhonda Boyajian, the coordinator of Vemkar Christian Education and the coordinator of St. Peter Armenian Church Adult Christian Education. Rhonda? Thank you, RP. I would like to welcome everyone to Vemkar Adult Christian Education. A warm welcome back to our students from St. Peter Adult Christian Education. And to the new faces and names in our Zoom squares, welcome new students. We are so happy you are here. Our program is richly filled. Each session will touch upon our project objectives, which are to develop a greater understanding of how God is working through the Armenian church, to create opportunities which will improve your communal and individual prayer life, and to have guided discussion of practical life issues. Our format remains the same, which is 30 minutes of instruction and 30 minutes of Q&A discussion. I encourage you before class to read the brief description given for each session on VEMCOD. Read it before class, this three to four sentence overview of what you will be learning. See what questions rise up within you. Perhaps jot a few of those questions down. Ask yourself, where do I see this in scripture? Where do I see this in my own life? As we have learned, developing curiosity is the beginning of learning. Your input as students is vital to the growth and development of our curriculum. So at the end of the semester, you'll be asked to fill out a short survey and your feedback will most certainly be part of our spring 2022 semester. How exciting that all of us together are part of this pilot semester. Oh, and one more important thing, bring your Bibles to class. With that, I would like to turn this to Father Stepanos deduction. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, it is such a joy this evening to kick off our VEMCAR Adult Christian Education program and classes. Um, our humble beginnings uh, in many of our parishes, you know, we offer adult Christian education in, in a variety of ways. And St. Peter Armenian Church has been no different uh, from offering Bible studies, uh, retreats, lectures, discussions, and, uh, and prayer group, uh, we have uh, formulated over the years and developed um, an overarching program called Adult Christian Education. Uh, more than just simply classes, but a spiritual and liturgical development um, in the Armenian church for her faithful. And um, so I, I'm so thankful and grateful to our parish um, for having so many wonderful people that are open um, to uh, the Lord's will and to God's word. And uh, we have been able to um, move forward with our adult ed programming. Uh, it was last January or so, maybe even longer than that, that uh, we had been dialoguing about uh, Vemkar uh, adopting St. Peter Armenian Church's uh, adult education program. But for Rhonda and I, it became formalized in uh, this past January. Uh, there were one or two classes in particular that we both resonated afterwards that 
um, we need to be offering this for our diocese. And uh, Rhonda is just a wonderful example of the many ministers that we have at St. Peter Armenian Church. Uh, we have a well-developed ministry team there. And uh, I'm excited that Rhonda is, is also a St. Nurse Seminarian. And uh, she's, she takes one, one or two classes each semester at the seminary. And that was uh, born from our adult education, and of course, from her deep faith. Um, so thank you all. Serpa Zanhaid, we're looking forward uh, to your presentation tonight to kick us off uh, in adult Christian education. And the topic is so befitting uh, to your liturgical uh, expertise and background with your PhD in liturgy. Uh, the topic is turning from sorrow, repentance and confession in the Armenian church. Thank you, Serpa Zanhaid. Thank you, Der Stepanos and Arpi and Rhonda and all of you that uh, are work, have worked so hard, uh, our diocese and staff and all of our uh, folks out there uh, whose names were mentioned uh, that work together uh, to put this adult education uh, mm -hmm. ministry together. And um, I, I can only feel pride um, as the primate to see uh, such a large number of, of you gathered in this very special way, obviously via Zoom. Um, and, uh, and the rich program that, that lies ahead every week. I hope that, that uh, truly we can grow together, um, those that are here this evening, the others that hopefully will join us over the course of the next few weeks. Um, our topic tonight, as I now attempt to share my screen, are we good? Can I see my title slide? RP, are we good to go? Okay, so turning from sorrow, penance or repentance and confession um, in the Armenian church. This is something that I teach regularly at the seminary. And um, it's an area where, one of many areas where I think what we've grown up and learned sometimes uh, is actually diverges a bit from, from a deeper understanding of our church's tradition and even the Bible's understanding of some of these terms. Um, oftentimes what has been transmitted to us um, regarding church teachings, regarding the interpretation of the Bible, the message of the Bible, the parables, um, even the history of the church and the saints, um, for whatever reason, tends to be sort of the, the, the surface level. It's kind of a superficial. And sometimes that's because that's the way we need to teach these things to younger people. And, and some of us have not had opportunities to really continue to study these things at a deeper level. So um, this is one of those topics, penance and confession, that uh, I'm always eager to talk about when I teach it at the seminary. And uh, so when Rhonda approached me and said, what, what kind of a topic would you like to talk about? This is, um, this is high um, in my mind. Now I am, here we go. There we go. Um, are you seeing that? Yes. Sorry. Okay, so let's kind of jump right into things. I don't want to take uh, more than my, my time allows so that we'll have plenty of time for you to ask questions and, and make comments. So the word penance in Armenian is abashkarutyun. I'm a person who's very interested in words. I think oftentimes words that we use, especially when it's words in another language, um, often can give us glimpses and nuances on a concept, uh, the concept that that word designates, uh, that sometimes escapes us. And uh, this is a great example of it, abashkarutyu, a big long word, uh, made up of three words, uh, three, let's say, roots in Armenian, ab, uh, which is an Indo-European prefix. It means ab, right, ab, if you think of the word abduct, or abject, abduct is to take away, um, abject is to throw away. So ab means away in Armenian as well as English. Um, and then the ending, utyun, is another Indo-European root, which we have in English. In English, the equivalent is T-I-O-N, organization, information, satisfaction. That shun becomes, or actually utyun, which is much more primitive, becomes T-I-O-N in English. So it's, it's that suffix that indicates an abstract noun, basically. The key here is the word in the middle, ashhar. All right, um, 
I can't see your faces. If we were in the classroom, I would be picking on you now and asking you, what does that word ashkar mean? And many of you will say, well, ashkar means world, right? Ashkar. Uh, ashkar is the word uh, for world in, our, in modern Armenian. And, um, and so many people, and, and some of these people are our teachers, maybe even some clergy, have misinterpreted this word, ab ashkar utyun. Ab means away. Ashkar, if we assume that that means world, as it does in modern Armenian, and then the, the uh, abstract suffix means away from the world, out of the world. So penance, abashar utyun, would be understood as something that is to escape the world, leave the world aside. And the assumption would be, well, we leave the world aside so that we can ascend to a higher place, be more godly, be more heavenly, right? That would be the assumption. And I know I learned this um, in various places and sometimes in authoritative books. And um, it is simply not the case because as you see on the bottom of the screen, Yes, the word ashar means world, but notice, even if you don't read Armenian, at the end of the first uh, word there, there's a, an H looking level, uh, letter, and that is a letter H actually in Armenian. But there's another word ashar that does not have that kind of silent H, uh, which is not heard too frequently in modern Armenian. And it means something entirely different. It means mourning, it means grief, sorrow, lament, and a whole range of words that have that sort of dark, um, sad, sorrowful idea. So the Armenian word abashkarutyun really means to escape or to leave aside or to move away, not from the world, but from grief and mourning and darkness and sorrow and lament. Um, there's a wonderful, um, well, it's a letter that I discovered years ago when I was the director of the Zorab Center uh, at the diocese, our big library at the diocese. I was reading through a book of prayers and writings by St. Nersa Shnor Ali, our 12th century uh, patron saint of our seminary. And, um, and there, among many, many other you know, beautiful spiritual prayers and writings, is something called a letter of consolation to a certain Eastern prince on the tragic death of his child. And that's all we know about this writing. We don't know who this Eastern prince is. We don't know the circumstances of the tragic death of that prince's child. All we know is that Nerses Ali wrote a very pastoral, very compassionate um, letter to this prince, um, which is many, many pages long. And it's not a letter the way you and I might write a letter, but it's poetry. And it's divided into many dozens of verses those verses have a particular meter, and they also rhyme. Um, and right in the middle of that, it, it's worth reading. I've translated it, and we, we can send it to you someday if you're interested. But uh, I just want to read this one verse out of many, many that we could talk about all night uh, and listen to how it sounds. Gentanin yevgen arar, ein vor tsainiv gochiatz zhazar, arkez koche asvat zapar, lutze sukko yev zashkar. So you hear the meter. And you hear how the last line has this ending of ar, 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 ar. Well, notice the word ashkar there, the very last word in the Armenian, zashkar or ashkar, which here means sorrow. Um, my translation, I've tried to be a little bit poetic. I've had to use a little bit of, of uh, uh, flexibility to make the line, to, to preserve the meter and the rhyme. The living one who makes alive, whose voice dead Lazarus did revive, almighty God now calls to you, to break your sorrow, lift, renew. So the living one is, is Christ. Uh, the living one, Christ, brings us life. He makes us alive, just as he did to Lazarus in the tomb, right? Whom he revived simply by the power of his voice. Come out, Lazarus. We know that story. Um, Almighty God now calls to you. That's you and me. Um, and specifically, Nerses was writing to this prince, and saying, now it's time for you. He's calling to you. As he called to Lazarus, now that life-giving voice is calling to you so that he may break your sorrow, dissolve your sorrow, lift you up, renew you, give you life. So that, in about the best way I could imagine, is what penance is. From an Armenian perspective, which, as we'll see, is very much 
a biblical perspective, um, as we can see just in this one line. Um, I love this poem, um, uh, just, just beautifully. Lifting us out of our sorrow, removing us out of our sorrow, our mourning, our sadness, our anxiety, and bringing us to a place of renewal and life and joy. That's what penance is. And I, I don't know if that's how we've been taught what penance is way back when we were in Sunday school or in whatever spiritual books we might have picked up and read over the years. I know many of you are, are avid uh, students of theology and, and Bible. Um, and in fact, you know, there are loud voices out there that teach us a very different understanding of penance. Penance tends to have a kind of a negative connotation in many ways. That's really not the traditional approach of the Armenian church. And again, if we want to go to the Bible, um, I always say the cardinal uh, illustration of penance um, in the Gospels is in the story of the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. And you all know that story, and I don't need to review it for you. I'm going to cut right to the middle. All right, the son has gone his way. He's taken his inheritance, and he spent it all. And he's had a good jolly old time. And now he finds himself um, sitting in a pig pen, uh, wishing he could eat the food that the pigs are eating. Um, and there's a moment there of change. There's a moment of conversion. There's a moment of realization. And, and, it, and it begins at this verse 17. When he came to himself, we'll talk about that phrase in a second. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And we know the rest of the story. But these verses here capture that, that turn. This is the, the, the twist in the plot. Comes com absolutely unexpected. He came to himself. In Armenian, yev yegyal imidis yur, which we could kind of translate as he came to his senses. He realized with his brain, midis, he, with his brain, with his mind, he realized what he had fallen into. He realized the consequences of the actions that he had taken. He came to his senses. Boom. From that point on, he turns, literally turns and goes back to his father. And that's the beginning of his, um, of his reconciliation with his father, of, of being able to be restored to normal life and to the life that he felt he was worthy of. Right? And he sort of thinks to himself, how many of my father's high age servants and so forth. We understand that. Um, he came to his senses. That's really what penance is about. Um, the whole story of the prodigal son, I'm going to try to hold up my book here. Um, um, can you see this? I hope you can see this because I can't see you and I can't see myself. But Henry Nouwen, who's a very, uh, a very prominent um, Dutch-born Catholic priest. He died some years ago, but was a professor uh, here in the United States at Harvard and Notre Dame and at many other places. Became one of the grand uh, uh, sort of authorities on spiritual life, Christian spiritual life. And among the dozens of books he wrote, he wrote a book called The Return of the Prodigal Son. And this, this sold millions of copies a few decades ago. And I had, <laughs> I, um, Someone recently gave me a copy of this, although I had two on my bookshelf that I read years ago and was very touched by them. And I've just read it again. And it's a remarkable book. And um, maybe RP um, uh, can, uh, can put in the chat. She can uh, give a link uh, for you to purchase that book. If you've never read that book, um, it, it would do you well to do that. It's the story of penance. Um, it's the story of the prodigal son. The other passage that I like from scripture uh, about penance is one that you wouldn't think of at first. Um, and it's from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's actually the very last verse of 1 Corinthians, St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Um, and in chapter 7, not to go into details, it's a, it's a long kind of an arduous, um, kind of hard to read chapter where St. Paul is talking to his little mission parish in Corinth. Uh, telling them that they've, they're out of line and they're not 
living their lives as in a way that that Christians should be living their lives. And he spends a lot of time talk a time about sexual immorality, um, the, the the preciousness of marriage, which is to be uh, treasured and uh, and held tightly, and a number of other things. He spends a lot of time on uncomfortable sexual immorality. And at the end of it, he has this line. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So at the end of this long chapter, he says, I say this for your own benefit, right? In other words, all this hard talk that I've given you is not to lay any restraint upon you. I'm not trying to control you. I'm not trying to make your lives hard. I'm not trying to create a whole legal system, right? A legalized religion. That's not my purpose. My purpose, St. Paul says, is to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Christian life is about consecrating our lives, everything that we are, everything that we say, everything that we do, all of our thoughts, all of our deeds to the Lord in an undivided manner. See, the Lord Jesus should not be a part of our lives. He needs to be our lives, right? Um, uh, I, I, I tend to go on tangents and, I, and, I, and it, it gets me into trouble because I end up talking longer than I want to. But, um, you know, the secular world we live in, secular, the word secular does not mean godless. People that are secular do not deny the reality of God. What they do is they separate God on one side and the rest of life on another side. So the secular mentality says Sunday is the day of the Lord. You go to church, you pray, you make your offering, you sing, you have coffee, you create fellowship, and then you come back to the real world, right? That's the secular attitude. But, but St. Paul says no. Secularism is a problem for Christians because Jesus wants our undivided devotion. The same way that your husband or your wife needs you 100%, not 50%, right? Not 10%. Okay, you can't be sitting on each other's laps all the time. Somebody's got to go to work. You got to go shopping. You got to mow the lawn and raise the children and all the other things. But in and through all of those things, we must find our way, if we're married, to be undividedly devoted, 110% devoted to one another. That's what the Lord expects of us. So how does this fit into the idea of penance? Well, it goes right back to the prodigal son, right? What did the son do? The son said to the father, I'm done being under your roof. Um, I will gonna, I'm going to get half the inheritance. You're a wealthy man. I want it now. And I'm going to go and have fun while I'm young. I don't want to have to wait till I'm 50 before I have some money and to enjoy my enjoy the money that's due to me anyway. Now, what the prodigal said, he didn't break any law. He did not commit a crime. According to the standards of the day, it was, it was quite immoral and rather mean and hurtful and selfish. But he didn't break a law. He didn't break a, a, a commandment of God. Um, but that's not the point. He took his devotion away from his father. And, and you know how the parable works. It's not about a father and a son. It's about our father in heaven and all of us who are his sons, his children. And that's about penance. That's what penance is about. So we're going to talk about penance. We have to talk about sin. And I will go right back to that last slide. According to St. Paul, sin, I would argue, and I think St. Paul would agree with me, sin is anything that distracts us from undivided devotion to the Lord. Anything that distracts us from undivided devotion to the Lord. That should send a little shiver down all of our spines, beginning with the bishop, right? Um, am I 100% in all my thoughts and deeds devoted to the Lord as one whom I love with all my heart? That's a hard question. That's a hard question. In my day, in how, in how I go about my day, does my life reflect undivided devotion to the Lord? Now we're in the world of penance, right? This is what St. Paul, the question essentially that St. Paul is asking us. And if 
there is something that is pulling me away from that, that is sin. Now that sin may be, you know, something that I do that's wrong, right? Immoral. But it could be something as simple as getting in the car and driving to the grocery store. If I become completely separated and, and isolated from, from God's love for me and my acknowledgement and awareness of God's love for me, I am in a state of sin. Okay, so, so and, and we can say more. Sin, therefore, is anything that distances us from God, right? Gosh, in these times of, of pandemic and war and, 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 and polarization and meanness, talking with someone today that uh, was very upset because someone in his church parish on Sunday went up to his wife and just said horrible, horrible, mean things because she hasn't had the vaccine yet. Horrible, mean, mean things. Well, boy, that, I guess that for that woman, that was, that was a moment of being distanced from God. How can I be so mean to another person when, when I'm not so perfect myself, number one, and, and I'm a person, if I know that God loves me despite my frailty, my human frailty and my errors, then how can I possibly go and act in a different way with those around me? That's sin. Sin is anything that distances us from God. Sin is anything that alienates us from God's love. Are we aware, really, of God's love for us? Do we reflect on that? Do we see that and experience that in certain ways in our lives? I'm sure we do at certain times. Um, keep some of these questions in mind for our conversation. But if I feel distanced from that, if I'm not feeling God's love, then the proper attitude should be an attitude of penance. Now, penance the way that I've been talking about it. Penance not as punishment, but penance as I need to be thinking about what it is that has made it hard for me to grasp the enormous joy of being a child of God. Maybe I'm spending too much time on Facebook. It might be as simple as that. Maybe I've got an addiction of some sort. Maybe I am, uh, I'm, I've got some you know, mental instability because of all the craziness in the world around us. Um, maybe I have guilt on my heart because I know I've done something wrong. I was dishonest. Um, I gossiped, right? But anything that alienates us from God's love is sin. Um, anything that breaks our unity with God so now we're going into, you know, we're, we're pushing this a little bit deeper. What God wants from us is union with us. He wants to be one with us. Again, the, the beautiful, precious example in the Armenian church and in the Bible is the union of, a, of, of, of husband and wife who physically become one um, out of a desire to share one another's lives, not only emotionally and common interests, but physically. And that physical sharing, by God's grace, uh, gives forth in creation. We become um, so close to God that we can we become able to be creators ourselves, right? Of children, those of us that are called to that particular vocation. So when we do not feel or we are not committed to unity, to growing ever closer to God, so that ultimately become one with God then something's broken down and that needs to be repaired. And that reparation process is what we could call penance. By the way, unity with God, the biblical word for unity with God is communion. In some of our English translations that comes out as fellowship or sharing, depending upon how literal um, your English translation is. But the original Greek word and the Armenian word, havortutun, is communion, sharing in unity. Co is a partner or sharing, union is union. So when we share many things, many people come together as one with God as the glue binding us together in Christ, that's communion. So maybe, maybe uh, RP will invite me back another day and we can talk about communion a little bit um, because that's another lecture altogether about how that happens. Communion, we think of as, you know, the little particle that's placed on your tongue during, during the badarak. That's communion too. But communion is much bigger than that. So sin is all of these things. Notice that 
I have not at once or barely talked about sin as a matter of moral failure. I did something morally wrong, and therefore that's a sin, right? I need to live a morally upright life because if I don't, that's a sin. Well, that's not entirely wrong, but sin is not in the first place a matter of moral failure, right? Stay with me here. Sin is not the committing of a crime or breaking a law, right? When we break a law, if I steal something from someone, that, by the way, is also a sin, but not because we broke a law, but because we separated ourselves from the lifestyle that God expects from us as his children, right? When I, when I steal something from another person, I am showing my lack of compassion um, and lack of communion with that other person. If I don't have compassion toward another human being and I don't value them uh, and, and their possessions and their home and, and the sanctity of what they have or what they've earned, then simultaneously, the other side of the same coin is I'm not valuing what God has given me. That's why it's a sin, not because I broke a law. And we could, we could talk about the Ten Commandments if you like. Well, if you break a, com a commandment, you're breaking the law. Yeah, but not simply because you broke a law, but because the Ten Commandments in the language and the world of, of ancient Israel was the best they could do to understand communion with God through Jesus Christ, whom yet they did yet not know. So God and God's wisdom says, you're not going to get this, but this is the way you're going to live your lives. And if you break these laws... The first of which being, you shall love the Lord your God, right? The, the, the Lord your God is one, right? Um, then, then you have no way of, of, of being devoted to that God. Um, so sin is not in the first place about school. You be nice. If you hit someone, then that's a sin. And you have to say you're sorry. And the person you hit has to say that's okay. And then Jesus is happy. Well, that's true. That's true, but sin is a whole lot more complicated than just following the laws of Christianity, right? In fact, there are no laws of Christianity. That's what Jesus did is he, he took that all away. He said, you don't need to follow laws anymore as far as your faith is concerned. Now, you, you know me. You just come and know me and know the love that our Father has for you by sending me here to become one with you. So it's not, you can follow every, you can, you can, you know, make a chart of 2000 different rules in the Bible. You've missed the whole point. So sin is not about committing a crime or breaking a law. Um, the ultimate final goal of the gospel is not moral cleanliness or the absence of sin, but unity with God, right? Communion with God oneness with God. We'll talk about that in, in, in a few minutes. We're not here to become sinless. One person is sinless, Jesus, the Son of God. We all are sinful, we're going to be sinful, and that's not going away. The miracle of our faith, the great gift of our faith, is that God says, I love you anyway. I know that what your life is that you're living. I love you anyway. You're going you're gonna to mess up. There are going to be times when you're going to commit moral failures. I love you anyway, to the extent that you turn to me and recognize that I am your life, not some book or some moral code or some uh, uh, you know, ceremony or ritual. I am the source of your life, God says to us through Jesus the Son. Unity with God. Right? So now penance becomes... Um, the environments, you know, the means by which we continually adjust and readjust ourselves so that we are always walking on a path that is leading to unity with God. All right. The goal of penance is to realign ourselves with the church as the body of Christ, to return to Christ, the Son of God, to Jesus, the Savior. This is not a one-time or a periodic occurrence. It is a daily, 
constant occupation. It is the very substance of Christian life, right? How do I become a better Christian? By means of penance, properly understood. Right? This constant realignment of ourselves to be ev devoting ourselves ever more clearly and closely with God through Jesus Christ, without whom none of this would be possible. We don't, you know, the only way we can know God is through Christ. We can't hear God the Father's voice. We have no image of God the Father. What we have is Jesus Christ, who's not far away somewhere, but within us. That's the importance of the church. The goal of penance is to realign ourselves with the church. Why? Because the church is the body of Christ in this world today. So if you're really, really careful when we're thinking about, you know, where is Jesus? Well, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's at the place you know, in, in, the, in the Father's lap, in his very highest place of honor in the kingdom right now as we speak. But Jesus didn't go away at the time of the ascension. He remains in the church, which, according to the Bible, is his body. Not just an organization that belongs to him. Okay, that's one way of putting it. But it is his very flesh and blood. And I choose those words carefully. The church is the body of Christ. And you hear me talking about building up the body of Christ, right? So a lot of the vision that I take from St. Paul, you know, we, our job is to build up the body of Christ for us in our little diocese here of the Armenian church is to reinvigorate and recommit ourselves and realign ourselves as individuals, as priests, as bishops, um, as children, as young people, as organizations, as women's guild, as deacons, as whoever we are, realigning ourselves with the church as the body of Christ. We are the members of that body. We are the ones that make Jesus present in the church. That's penance. That job is penance. And um, I have to talk about that carefully because if I go out to the diocesan assembly and I say, we have to repent. Our job is penance. They're going to look at me like I'm from some other place. Let's just leave it at that. You know what they're going to say. Where did this bishop come from, right? Um, some people are going to say, well, of course, repent. Of course, penance. But most people are not going to have any idea what I'm talking about. They're going to say, what did I do wrong? I live a good life. I'm, I'm good to my wife. I take care of my kids. I give money to the church. I go to church when I can. I, I help at the bazaar. What, what have I done wrong? All right, I got my little errors here and there, but I'm not a criminal. Yeah, penance is not about criminals. It can be, and it should be, but penance is about all of us, frail human beings, all right, in a fallen world. So now we have to talk about confession, all right? Confession, and again, you know, the word here is kostovanutyun. In this case, the word kostovanutyun, for our purposes, literally is translated confession. And in the Armenian, as in the English, the word confession is used in two ways that we tend to separate from each other. So on church on Sundays, we come forward, if we're still coming forward, or we kneel down in our places and we read that long confession. I've sinned against the all holy trinity and I've, these are all of the sins that I've committed. That's a confession of sin. Well, if you got to church a little bit earlier, you also confess, uh, uh, proclaimed or declared a confession of faith. We believe in one God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of things visible and invisible, the Nicene Creed, which is a confession, right? So to confess is to make a pledge, is to declare officially and publicly, right? The word host, hostum, host in the old, old languages from which Armenian comes means an oath, an official declaration in public, signed with your blood. So we confess our sin, right? Which may be a matter of saying, well, I, I lied to this person and I gossiped about that person. And I, I, I was late for church at that time. And I really should have done this and I didn't. And, and I, 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 I got angry at the football game and I said a word that I should have said. I did actually. Um, that can be a confession of sins, but it doesn't need to be an enumeration of things you did wrong because we just established that sin is not just the things we do wrong. Confession of sin means ultimately, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, 
I want to know your love. Jesus, I'm turning back to you. My mind was elsewhere momentarily. I said something I should have said, or I got caught up in a million other things going on. And my heart is not where it needs to be right now. I want to be with you right now. That can be through prayer. It can be through, through you know, compassionate acts and words with another person. It can be reading the Bible. It can be whatever it is. But that is confession of sin. And confession of faith is, sure, the I will now publicly proclaim my adherence, my belief in the, in the fundamental dogmas of the Armenian church. Okay, that's a confession of faith. But it doesn't have to be that. And I, I think you see where I'm going. Confession of sin is confession of faith. Confession of faith is confession of sin. It's one remarkable unity. I don't know how much we think about these. You know, these are things that I don't think we did in Sunday school anyway. But these are ideas that are extremely rich. And if we listen carefully to the words of Jesus and we read them, we realize that he doesn't make any distinction between confessing our sins and confessing our faith. He goes to the leper, you know, your sins are forgiven. Now come and follow me. Right? It's one action. It's one action. Come be with me. Follow me means come into communion with me. I don't want you far away. Get up on your feet and start walking toward me and walking with me. Right? Wherever your head was, whatever your hands did, whatever your mind was, wherever, wherever you were, that's in the past now. Now get up and follow me. Get up and come be with me, with us. It's the same reality. That's penance and confession in the deepest and truest sense. And if you're asking yourself a lot of questions right now, like this doesn't make sense according to what I've always thought, good. All right, what else can we say? Confession is not a therapy for moral faults. Wow, we've been taught this very, very successfully over the years. And I'm not here to judge anybody, but simply to state the facts. All right, we, we, we get into this pattern where, well, and we've heard this before, and maybe we can be honest enough to admit that we've thought this. Well, you know, I really, I really shouldn't skip my prayer today. But you know what? I'm, I'm, I, I want to get to the store before, before the sale you know, before the shoppers end up there in the sale hands. So I'm going to, I'll, I'll get back to it tomorrow. Or, you know, whatever your little fault might be. And anyway, I'm going to church on Sunday and I'll, Jesus will, will, will forgive. Me. Okay, but, but, but that's not what confession is. Confession is not about that. We have reduced in the Armenian church for lots of reasons. We could talk about another day. We have reduced this broad, beautiful idea of confession of sin, confession of faith confession of love, right, into a kind of a, you know, like, you know, the priest gets up there and he says a few words and waves his hands around and poof, now you're sinless. Whoa. That doesn't correspond with anything in the Bible. It, did, it just doesn't. Um, and, and, you know, and I'm not faulting the priest here. I'm a priest too. But it, 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 um, it, it shows that we've sort of allowed ourselves to be reduced in our understanding to the marvelous gift, which is penance and confession. So it's not like I can commit whatever sins I want. And as long as I go and get on my knees at night, you know, before I go to bed or in front of the priest on Sunday morning, everything's okay. That's not what confession is. All right. Confession is about returning myself to the Lord. All right. Then, then the, the question that we always ask, well, do we have private, you know, private confession versus corporate confession, right? Public confession, private versus public, personal versus corporate. Um, well, the, the answer is easy. Yes, we have private confession in the Armenian church. It's not as, um, as legalized and as, as um, can I say, uh, customary as we find, for example, in the Catholic church. The Catholic church is they're big on private confession. Um, you, if you want to go to church on Sunday and receive communion, you better darn well go to confession first, right? Go to confession, right? It's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a different world. I remember when I was a teenager, my, my, my old friend, Tom Stratford, um, uh, was, uh, he was in a, in a very, very Italian Catholic family. And I remember I'd be over at his house. We were probably 11 or 12. And we'd be playing a game. It would be about five o'clock or four o'clock on Saturday afternoon. His mother would yell up the stairs, Tommy, 
get down here. We're going to church. You got to confess, right? And, and I remember Tom looks at me like this. He rolls his eyes. He's like, ah, this is bad. he's going to go and he's going to kneel in front of the priest and he's going to make up something or try to desperately think of what horrible thing he did during the week and confess it to the priest so that it, he will be allowed to go to mass on Sunday and receive communion. Well, this is a very, I'm not here to, you know, to, to, to judge or to evaluate the Catholic church. They've done a lot of things a whole lot better than we have, but this is a very reduced understanding of confession and penance and communion. So yes, we have private confession in the sense that when the need arises and we get stuck, you or I get stuck and we find that we're reaching, a, you know, there's a period of time where I'm feeling a distance between myself and my prayer, myself and God, myself and my feelings of compassion and service toward those around me. I'm overcome by anger, guilt, right? That's a good time to go and speak to, um, to a priest, you know, is, is a good way to do it. Sometimes we have, we can, we can confess our sins to another person who may or may not be a priest, um, a person that knows everything about us, to whom we can open up honestly and securely and confidently. And just to, to, just to go through that process in a spirit of love and prayer um, can, can be very, very precious and very, very valuable. Um, priests have, have a particular responsibility to be available to do that, and all of our priests do that. Um, we can talk more about this, if you like, about how, how does one go about having private confession. But again, it's not about, I did something evil, now I need to go confess to the priest. That's mechanical. That's, faith is not a machine. It's not a simple five-step process. It's about re-consecrating ourselves, re-devoting ourselves to undivided devotion to the Lord. The opposite of that would be corporate confession. Um, and again, you saw how we spoke about, about penance and confession as an issue of the church. So your sin is not your sin. Your sin affects the church, right? And define sin as we have. So whether that is an evil deed that you did, something horrible you said, that sin, or just a larger kind of sense of where you are in your life, your, your unwillingness or inability to grow closer to oneness, loving oneness, communion with God, that's my problem, even though you're the one that's dealing with it. And it's my problem, but I also have the possibility to restore that communion for you, with you, not as a bishop or priest, but just as a, someone who, who is trying to walk the path of God with you. And we call those people the church. And the path of God is not a path where we sinful Armenians are in our little church in Water of Elite, and God is over there someplace in heaven looking down on us. No, because when we come together in the prayer of the church, in the liturgy of the church, especially the Badarak, then Christ is in our midst. So we are walking together. So the, the concept of confession and penance is in the church, right? So there may be private confession, but that confession ultimately means to be in the church. That doesn't mean that you stand in the middle of the church and shout about all the things you did wrong last week. But it means that we are on a path together with Christ in our midst. And Christ is in our midst in the body of Christ, in the body of Christ in the church, in a way that he isn't in any other setting. So then to whom do we confess our sin? And you notice I'm using the word sin and not the word sins, although the word in Armenian and Greek can be either singular or plural, um, because the word sin gives us more of a sense of a state of being, of separation, rather than simply this, the things I did wrong, which is way too limiting and distracting. So to whom do we confess our sins? Well, as I said, we should confess our sin to one another. We should have prayer partners. We should have um, uh, brothers and sisters that are close to us in a particular way with whom we discuss our life in Christ, with whom we discuss our state of sinfulness, with whom we discuss our sense of nearness to God, right? The high moments where we feel like we're almost being touched by God. 
right? To whom others can turn, right? We can turn and to whom they can turn to us from time to time. Sometimes that takes place in Bible studies. Um, sometimes it doesn't, right? But those kinds of gatherings, each one of us should have those. God, you know, bless you, two or three people uh, with whom you can discuss your inner heart and your, our inner common journey to, to Christ and with Christ to God. Um, and then occasionally, um, I think it's good for all of us from time to time to meet with the priest. Maybe it's your parish priest. Maybe it's another priest. You know, sometimes we don't have that kind of an intimate relationship with, with the, you know, the, our current parish priest. That's okay. But there are lots of priests around. Um, and we have some of our priests are, are actually very, very good at, at discussing and, and hearing our confession and discussing that with us and helping to sort of get us back onto the right track. Um, and, and our priests also are trained to be able to assist us if maybe there's more involved here than simply a guilty conscience or a little bit too much anger. Um, we're working with our priests right now, actually, this month um, about the connection between um, spiritual well-being and mental well-being and physical well-being. These are all intersected, right? If I have a horrible pounding headache, I just don't want to pray right now. I just don't. Well, that has an effect on my spiritual well-being. My mental well-being, or lack thereof, right, is a horrific problem right now in our world. Um, well, if I'm mentally not well, if I'm, if I'm on the border of depression, if I'm being pounded by anxiety or panic attacks, that, that's going to affect my prayer life and my life in church and my life in Christ. And it, it probably is affecting my physical life as well. So it's good for us from time to time. We don't have to be, even the Catholics don't necessarily go to confession every week anymore um, in the last number of decades. But, um, you know, that is a good habit that all of us should, should adopt from time to time, a couple times a year and as needed to sit down with the priest and say, I, I just want to, I want to kind of pour out my heart a little bit. Um, this has been an obstacle for me. I feel like I'm not growing anymore toward God. Um, I felt awful anger toward some people. Or maybe there is actually something you did or thought that's really holding you back. It's, it's distracting you from your, in your devotion to God. Um, when we're talking about, we're talking about general confession, right? This thing that we've, we've you know, general confession where it actually is not a part of the Badarak, where, but it's become a part of the Badarak in recent custom. Right before Holy Communion, it's now time for general confession. Fall your knees, turn to page 48 in the Red Book, and follow the deacon as he reads. You know, I have sinned against the all Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Melas is all right. That's, that's not bad, but it's misleading in a lot of ways um, because it just, it, just um, um, it reinforces this, this inaccurate idea that I can live my life any way I want, and as soon as I bow down on my knees on Sunday morning and receive communion, I'm clear, I'm ready to go, right? Now suddenly I'm sinless, right? Because the priest waved his hands and said a few words. What, what does that do? The priest doesn't have any power to forgive your sins. God has power, if we're going to talk about it as power, to forgive sins. So that's, that's problematic. Um, the whole idea that we have to sit right, between, right before Holy Communion and confess our sins is not a bad thing. It's a good thing to confess our sin and our faith. But did anybody ever notice that every single word of the Badarak from beginning to end is a confession of sin and a confession of faith? Every hymn, every prayer, every kados, no exceptions. So for us to insist, and again, it's a recent practice within less than a century that everybody kneels down at this point and has to confess this this long formula that may or may not speak to my heart at any given day um, is, is problematic. It's still not a bad thing. And um, in any case, the word, uh, let, let, the word artsagem, uh, when the priest says, I absolve you of all participation in sin, the word artsagum in Armenian means I dissolve, I dismiss it, I release you from it. If those things that are on your mind, get them out. Let's, let's work together. Let's strengthen one another to get back on the path, back in that blessed status of being God's children in his very presence. Or rather, he is the one who finds his presence in us. He's always there. 
We just don't always see it. We're coming to the end here. Because I know Arpi is getting nervous now. Let's look at that prayer of absolution, um, which actually is not a prayer. The priest is not actually praying to God here. He's speaking to us. And I want to just point out a few things. Um, may God, who loves mankind, have mercy on you and forgive you all of your sins. Who's doing the forgiving here? Father Kevork, Bishop Daniel? Nope. God. God is forgiving you. What is the priest saying? May God forgive you. I'm here to remind you that God is here to forgive you. And I'm here to pray with you as the, as the, vo the voice of our little body of Christ here in Waterville, in Tenafly, in, in uh, Evanston. Um, may God, who loves mankind, have mercy on you and forgive you all of your sins, both those which you have confessed, as well as those which you have forgotten. Evidently, God is not too worried that your list of sins uh, is absolutely correct. Evidently, God sees sin as more than just the absolute, you know, comprehensive you know, register of every bad thing you've done or thought. Evidently, God's not too worried about that. Even if you forgot your sin, that's okay. Therefore, with the priestly authority committed to me, so the priest does have a certain authority which has been given to him. Yes, that is not to forgive you for every sin that he doesn't even know about. No, that's bad theology. That's unbiblical theology. That's not the Armenian church's theology. But the priest does have authority. Um, someday you'll invite me to talk about ordination of a priest, and we'll talk about what that authority really is. So therefore, with the priestly authority committed to me and the Lord's command, by the Lord's command, that, comma, quotation mark, these are the Lord's words, whatever you forgive on earth shall be forgiven in heaven, comma, end of quotation. Now the priest is speaking again. Jesus spoke. Now the priest is speaking again. By his very word, Bishop Daniel says, referring to Jesus, I release you of all participation in sin, in thought, in word, and in deed. How did I do that? By the mystical powers that God has given me on the day of my ordination? No, by the word of the Lord. Because Jesus said, whatever you forgive on earth, the earthly things that we do and st states that we fall into, if you forgive it on earth, it shall be forgiven in heaven. By that promise, by that quote, by those words of the Lord, I can dare to absolve you of all participation in sin. Because I too am a sinner. I'm no better a person than you are. And again, remember what we said. Christian life is not about sinless life. It's about life in communion with God and one another as the body of Christ. Right? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And I reinstate you into the sacraments of the Holy Church. So we're not going to be able to get into that portion of what penance is all about. And by the way, in the Armenian church, the Armenian church fathers will hang on those white words right there by his very word, the very word that we have heard that Jesus spoke 2000 years ago is not just in a book. Now it's not just type in your Bible. It's not just printed words and images on a Bible page. That word is alive today. That word is nothing less than Jesus himself. So when we reflect on the word of Jesus, which is the word of God's son, when we recite that word, especially when the priest recites that word in the hearing of everyone, then it is Jesus himself forgiving us our sin. And if you want to see that in a way that no theologian in all of Christendom has stated it, read St. Gregory of Nodic's prayers. His prayers, which, by the way, he calls not prayers, but words. 90, whatever the number is, not prayers, they're words. And in those words of prayers, of words, Jesus is acting. That's what's so great about Gregory of Nodic. Did I say Dative? I meant to say Nodic. Okay, we're almost done. Where is that quote from? You know the passage. Twice, Jesus, Matthew's gospel quotes Jesus twice. The second time is in chapter 18. Speaking to his disciples, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. 
That's called penance. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother or sister. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. That's the church. Bring them with you. That's your prayer group. Those are the people that care for this person. You're this brother or sister that sinned against you. Take one or two others along with you that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Leave him alone. He's in a state of mind at this point where he cannot process what he's done. I spoke to someone today that had an encounter with a person, uh, a, a different case. You know, people call me when they're angry and hurt by people that have hurt them. We're living in a pandemic world where we are just not showing, we're not able to step up and be the best that we can be as human beings. And unfortunately, the worst and dark, darkest of humanity comes out in us lately. Look, sometimes it's just better to leave it alone let time work, pray for that person, and let God do his work. And you pray that something good will come. Sometimes the best we can offer in our words and our intent is just not, it's just not the time. Truly I say to you, Jesus continues, whatever you bind up on earth, the word is what you do to a piece of rope. You tie it up in a knot. Whatever you tie up in a knot on earth shall be tied up into a knot in heaven. That should scare us. And whatever you loosen up on earth, untie, loosen up, shall be unloosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That's the body of Christ, the, you know, two or three. Our Christian life is life lived in community. The only place where there can be love Christian love is where we are together, struggling through our pains and our angers and our hurts and our frustrations together, forgiving one another, loving one another, helping one another, caring for one another, lifting each other up, praying for one another, learning together, growing together. That's the only place where the gospel of Jesus Christ makes any sense. And if anybody thinks that you can be a Christian by yourself, in your living room, on your own terms, you can memorize the Bible. You're not a Christian at least not in any way that Jesus tells us. And that's the body of Christ, this struggling, frail cons you know, consortium of men and women and kids that are sometimes prayerful and wonderful and sometimes mean and nasty and sometimes mentally ill and sometimes doing their best under the horrific circumstances. And penance is about the body of Christ coming together despite all of that and saying, we're here for one another. Jesus Come and be strong within us. I think that's the last slide. So penance is a sacrament of the church. Not because it's one of the seven sacraments. Throw that away. That's, that's, that's old, bad Catholic theology. Good Catholics don't even believe there are seven sacraments anymore. And we, we continue to teach our kids there are seven sacraments. Ah, throw it away. It's not helpful. Penance is, however, a sacrament of the church. It is sacrament of the church. Why? Because the sacraments are anything we do in the church. That means amongst one another, ideally under that compass, that builds us up as the body of Christ. Not just as the Water of Lake community, which has the best food festival in the autumn of the entire diocese. Oh, ouch, 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 right? Or whatever, fill in the blank. That's a great church. Um, it doesn't build us up just as a successful parish that has paid all its bills. All right, no. It builds us up as the body of Christ, as a community, a consortium, a family of men and women and children, very frail, very imperfect, that, however, continuously calls on the name of Christ and opens ourselves up so that he's with us. So penance is a sacrament because it's a process. It's the air we breathe. It's not a moment. It's not a service. It's not one prayer. It's not this moment or that moment. It's not this ceremony or that ceremony. It's everything we do as Christians living in the church as the body of Christ with each other. And therefore, it's communion. It's building the body of Christ. It's building this communion, this unity with God the Father in Jesus Christ who is in our midst and therefore with one another.
unity with God, unity with one another, all in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, God speaks to Ezekiel the prophet, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God, so turn and live. I am here as life, God says, and Jesus says, you just need to turn to me, follow me, and you'll live. Everything else is details. Art yegaik, tartsaruk yevgetsek. Now come and turn, turn your ways and live. And I am trying to disconnect myself from sharing my screen, and I'm not able to do that. That's what I have to share with you, my dear ones. Thank you, Sirpa Hyde. A very important message for us to hear. Um, we have gone over a bit, but it was valuable time and well spent. I would like to open and take um, some questions to give.